I, I can't hear you. <laughs> no audio. Still can't hear you. Now I can hear you come from somewhere. Or is that Papa Mieri? No, I can't hear you, Kwambo. Hey, can you hear me, uh, Tio? <laughs> yeah, I can hear Papa. I will stop. Mm. Hi, Papa. How are you doing? Hi, Rina, are you okay? Not bad. How is Kakamega? Uh, Kakamega is okay. The veins have stopped for a little while. Ah. Uh, otherwise, we're just waiting to see what happens with this COVID situation. Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. Uh, we're, 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 we're all waiting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I tell you. That's why I said it's important to see this presentation today to see the way forward. Yeah, uh, we, we 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 decided just just put it together. Yeah, so that, so that we can share ideas mainly. Correct, correct. Because correct. because the, the the key guys who who will decide what's going to happen is is of course the Ministry of Health and, and government. Yeah, yeah. correct. Mm. But it looks difficult at the moment with the way the cases are rising. Yes. And especially ours being a contact sport. Yeah. Uh, I, I can see it to be a bit difficult right now. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, we have to survive this period and get through it. That's the main thing. Oh, 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 okay. Correct. And, and let, let, we still haven't hit the time. Let's, let's wait a couple of minutes. People are still yeah. joining. No problem. So there. Oh, yeah. I think so yeah. I mute myself. Looking too black, Mana. Hmm? I'm black. I've, I've been, and I've been, <laughs> and I've been indoors. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I should have become white. <laughs> you know, because of the Zoom meetings, I've put a light in front of me now so that yeah. you can see the face. That's the face, yeah. Yeah, because we are in so many Zoom meetings now. Mm. You have to be a bit clear on that. The, the 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 CS was saying that people people now have vitamin D deficiency <laughs> to get out. <laughs> yeah. People are staying indoors too much. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. Well, in that way, we are good in Kakamega. Yeah, at least we are getting out and about. Yeah. We now switch to playing some golf. At least that puts us out in the fresh air. Ah, okay. Not not that we play well, but we play anyway. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 and apparently the people it's affecting most are the kids because guys are not allowing their kids out there. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Correct, correct, correct. Hi, Jason. How are you doing? 
Hey, T, I'm all right. Thanks yourself. Good, good, good. Yo, yo, I, 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 are you in Cape Town or Jersey? I'm in Cape Town. Cape Town. A nice uh, cold uh, Cape Town, yeah. How is Cape Town? It's, it's colder than it's cold. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's cold, my man. It's cold. Uh, <laughs> it's been snowing on the mountains. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and the breeze from the Antarctic. I, I can't stand that. <laughs> it, it, it is Mbaya. It does not stop. Mbaya. <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. You guys still all right? Yeah, yeah. We're still okay. Uh, we're hanging in there. Uh, I'm just going offline for a second.
Oh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, good, 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 good evening, everybody. Yeah, good evening to you. Uh, uh, how is everybody? Hope everybody's safe and well. I, 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 my, my, my apologies for that the brief interruption. Uh, I, I think we're just about ready to go. Uh, okay, I was, I was about to introduce Doc, but, but she seems to be on a call. Uh, but, but we can start. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Carol Okoth. Uh, she's actually the chief medical officer for for NOC. Uh, she's a, a sports person as well. Uh, she's a, a former international. Uh, we, we, we've had uh, we've had a number of meetings uh, with with regard to discussing options for return to play. There was a meeting hosted by by, by NOC themselves, National Olympic Committee of Kenya. Uh, it, it was the first meeting we actually had that about. Uh, three or four weeks ago, uh, and, and then in the past two weeks, the, the, the government has set up a task force, which uh, is, is also reviewing options for, for return to play. Now, the, the task force asked all, all federations to, 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 to give their guidelines, mainly what they've got from their international federations and, 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 and what they think they're, they're planning to do. They, they've put all that together and, and they've handed it, it over to the Ministry of Sports. Uh, yesterday, we were with the Chief Administrative Secretary for the Ministry of Sport. He said the report is ready. Uh, it's ready for handing over to the, the President. But uh, however, they're waiting for, for, for the meeting between the President and, and all the governors. And then perhaps once they have all that other information, they can make an informed decision. Uh, I, 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 I reached out to Dr. Carroll uh j j j just to take us through uh the the disease itself i mean j j just as a, a simple overview of the understanding of of, of covid 19 or, or what it means to sports people and uh and what it will take for us to get back onto the field so uh i i i, I hope we've come with open minds and 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 questions and we'll see how to fill those so uh i i can see dr carol is now ready so i'll just hand over to her. I, I can see uh, Ch Chairman is here, but I'll, I'll let him speak at the end. Let, let's go ahead with the presentation because uh, I, I, I'm sure her phone is going to ring very soon. <laughs> Sasa Doc, over to you. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Doc. Hi, you can hear me clearly? Y yes, we can hear you. Okay, can I share screen or? Y yes, you, you can share your screen. Okay, so let me just share that. So you is it is it coming on? Uh, it doesn't come on. Let's try again. Okay, just... Are we? Oh, 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 okay, it's on now. Are we good? Okay, let me just put it on. Uh... presentation mode. Are we good? Yes, we're good. Okay, evening everybody. So I'm uh, Dr. Carol Okoth, as uh, Thomas has introduced. Uh, I hope you're all having a good evening so far. So as he said, uh, we find ourselves in a very, I say, difficult time um, as Kenyans, as people in general. And um, also, in addition to the fact that we are athletes, we find ourselves in an even more difficult situation. Thank you. 
Um, your your, your, mic, your mic is not. Um, you, you you seem to be breaking up, Dr. Just just start again. Am I good now? Yes. Now 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 you're fine. You're now it's fine. Okay. Yes. So okay. sorry about that. I'll just go ahead and start the presentation. Um. Okay. So basically, um, as we look at safe uh, resumption of sports. These are some of the areas I was looking at. Huh? So uh, what do we require to resume sports? Um, do we have any examples of other countries doing the same? What steps are uh, we to take in these efforts? And this one, more importantly at this time, what role are medics uh, playing in ensuring the safety of sports persons? And how are we going to enforce compliance to these measures that have been put into place? So I'll just start by explaining. Um, an athlete, in as much as we are, what I say, we are independent entities. This is the relationship we find ourselves in. An athlete comes from a family. An athlete will belong to a community. An athlete will belong to a, a country. In our case, we are Kenyans. And within Kenya, we find ourselves in a county, sub-county, and above all, we find ourselves part of the international community. In this sense, you'll find an athlete in Kenya, internationally belongs to the, uh, I think you'll call it the rugby, world rugby. Uh, the athletes belong to uh, world athletics. The hockey players, where I come from, belong to the International Hockey Federation. So in one way, the athlete, though is an individual entity, belongs to all these and uh, we find that in this scenario, there is a lot that is being, um, that is affecting the athlete that is coming from sources outside them. And why this is happening is that uh, there is that, um, how would I put it? There is the um, emphasis put on the public good. So the athlete is an important person because we realize you bring in medals for the country, you bring in glory for the country. But at the end of the day, the public good outweighs the, the athlete's personal needs. So when we look at that, you see a country putting or enforcing rules that an athlete has to follow. So briefly, what is uh, what I've written here as a SARS-CoV-2 infection, COVID-19. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 will refer to the severe acute respiratory syndrome. Basically, this is the virus that causes this disease we now know as COVID disease. The 19 refers to the, the year when the virus was discovered, the disease was discovered in China. So you'll see a lot of times as medics, we tend to use the SARS-CoV-2, uh, but a lot of us also refer it to COVID-19, especially in lay terms. So basically this is a highly infectious uh, virus, uh, predominantly affecting the respiratory tract. So all the way from the nose, the throat, all the way down to the lungs. And uh, we find that generally the symptoms of this illness um, are basically what we call flu symptoms. And that is because that is the area of the body that the virus tends to affect predominantly. And uh, in addition to that, we find that there are other parts of the body that are affected. And what I term as thromboembolic events, these are disorders of clotting. So you find clotting in the blood vessels of the limbs, in the brain, in the heart. And we are also seeing other presentations in the kidney. We're seeing people presenting diarrhea and vomiting. We're seeing people presenting with lack of smell, acute confusion. So the virus itself, once it's in the body, can present with various manifestations. And uh, in terms of the presentation of the disease, we've had of asymptomatic people who present without symptoms. We've had of people who present with mild disease. We've had of people present with moderate or severe disease. So uh, the one uh, that we usually are uh, finding ourselves associating with um, what we call mortality or death are the severe symptoms, the moderate symptoms. So these are people who present with a 
the um, what I call the worst spectrum of the disease, and this is the, those who have uh, shutting down of multiple organs in the body, people who present with difficulty in breathing. Asymptomatic means somebody who, as I'd said previously, has the virus, so when they're tested, the virus is there, but uh, they don't have any symptoms. So this is, the, this is the group we find ourselves having quite a challenge with because uh, this is where a majority of people are falling in the country and the same trend has been seen globally. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So globally, what we are seeing that basically each and every nation has been affected by COVID. And what we saw happen is around March, especially where most of the countries were being affected, majority of activities were stopped. There was stopping of movement within countries or stoppage of movement in between countries. And we find that the sports industry was not spared. Football, basketball, swimming, literally every discipline was stopped. And uh, around this time, uh, because this being an Olympic year, we found that a lot of our players could not even compete in the um, Olympic qualifiers. And this was because there was cessation of flights between countries. And in Kenya, we found that uh, because of the government directive, some of our athletes actually couldn't travel. So globally, we literally say each and every country has been touched by uh, COVID. Uh, it has resulted, it had resulted, especially around the early part of the year, March to May in uh, stopping of several activities. Um, and a lot of the uh, resources were being channeled into management of those who are ill and preventing uh, diseases. Currently, we're seeing um, what we are calling resurgence of infections, because what happened after May, a lot of countries decided to open up, open their borders, open uh, counties, open the cities, so that activities could resume. And the main drive of this was the economy, wanted to push up the country's economies, otherwise we were facing a major collapse of economies. And the sports industry also came in and we saw a lot of activity, especially around in uh, Germany. We saw it in uh, England, in the English Premier League, that the sports industries also wanted to boost the economies. And uh, currently what we are seeing, we are having new infections that are coming up. Uh, we are having countries like within Africa, we have South Africa, we have Egypt, we have our own country. We have the US and the US unfortunately is uh, having cases of up to 60,000 in a day. You can imagine how bad and how stressed they are. Uh, there's been a lot of push in the US for people not to wear masks, but we're now seeing that people are actually seeing the importance of that. Same in the UK. Um, in Kenya, Basically, what we are seeing in Kenya, um, we haven't really closed, uh, sorry, we had closed the, the, the country off to a lot of things, especially during those periods, March, and we pushed ours all the way to June. Um, uh, and I know there was a lot of uh, talk on uh, the economy, people uh, not being able to go out and get food. So there's a lot of push. But what we were seeing was that uh, a similar trend where cases continued rising dramatically. The Kenyan government moved in to stop movements uh, within the country, within and without the country, uh, between counties. So there was a lot of um, similarities in how the Kenyan uh, government responded to the, um, uh, the pandemic, uh, similar to what was seen in other countries. In Kenya, we saw, we started with Nairobi because Nairobi, um, by default is where most people travel into and out of in Kenya. The other city was uh, Mombasa. So we started, uh, forgive me for that, it's about, it's two counties, Nairobi and Mombasa. But now we're seeing 44 out of our 47 counties are affected. The ranking of the counties is basically based on the number of cases reported, the active cases, the recovered and the mortalities. And um, we're still seeing Nairobi and Mombasa leading in that. Other counties that are coming up are Kiambu, Kajiado, we have Busia. So Kenya, uh, basically like other places in the world, we see the disease starting in one place, mostly exported cases, cases that have a relation uh, to travel from China 
or other countries that had reported cases, but what we're seeing now is what we call community transmission. So basically, this I'll just give you a snapshot of what we have. Uh, this is uh, today's statistics. And what we can see is that increase as per the curve. Our numbers are still increasing. Um, what is of note is that three weeks ago, whatever we had in terms of restriction of movement in and out of Nairobi, Mombasa, Mandera was lifted. And uh, we are wondering as medics, is this surge as a result of allowing movements so that the areas that are now, that were originally hotspots are now sharing the burden of disease with the other communities. But within Nairobi, we know that the community as uh, transmission of infection is very well established. So uh, basically this is the consequence. And why I show this curve, I know there's been a lot of talk of flattening of the curve. So what we are seeing in Kenya, we still have not flattened the curve. The numbers are still rising. And as of, um, I'm not including the statistics given today, but at the start of the day, we had 15,601 cases. And uh, this number of males and females, and we can still see just as the global trend, it's more males affected than the, than the females. And that's the number of deaths we've recorded in Kenya. And unfortunately, Kenya finds itself as um, one of the countries, as you can see from the color, with very um, high number of cases reported daily, almost similar to what is being seen in South America and Central America, and in, um, this should be which part of the world, uh, in India. Just a minute. So basically, as I've already uh, mentioned, because the infection is high, uh, because this, uh, basically the virus is highly infectious and we're seeing very devastating effects. Uh, just as I'd mentioned, the health and safety of the people in general is the focus of the government. So most of the activities are generated towards that as opposed to looking at the athlete as an individual. And what we are seeing uh, is a lot of campaigns that still to date from the first case we reported in Kenya in March is focused on preventive measures. So we have the regular, the regular hand hygiene. This means washing of hands, uh, sanitizing. Uh, we've seen observing of respiratory etiquette. We are being asked not to cough into our hands. We cough into our elbows, not to cough into people. And whatever we use, uh, be it a, hun a hunky or a handkerchief or a tissue, we throw or dispose of immediately. And there is also the social distancing. Initially, we're being asked probably a meter. Now it's even two meters. And this distance is emphasized further for those who are presenting with symptoms. And... Um, we have this uh, campaign of use of masks, and uh, this is still, in fact, it's still being pushed in Kenya. We started very early with this, and we felt that this was what was protecting us initially. Um, part of the resurgence, we feel, could be because of uh, improper use of masks in public, uh, but that we can speak later on as we look at the proper way of using masks and the type of masks that are available. The curfews and restriction of movements I'd mentioned earlier, these are, uh, there was an ease of these, but we are wondering if uh, the meeting the president will have with the county heads next week may see a reintroduction of these. Mm, sorry. So basically in Kenya, we have these, uh, this uh, organization in terms of how we respond to the illness. So we have the National Emergency Response Committee. These are basically committees, the committee that is uh, the overall body that advises the country and advises the president. So whatever um, speeches the president makes is basically advised from the National Emergency Response Committee. And uh, below that we have the county response teams and the sub-county response teams. So the general public, how we access these is through the hotlines, uh, the hotline numbers, and the, yeah, basically it's the hotline numbers that are given to us to call. Uh, 
So these I had mentioned, and basically these are some of the presidential directives that were given. I won't go through them, but a lot of them, or rather the one that, I've, that really affects the sports industry is uh, the fifth bullet, where we're seeing banning of social gatherings. This remains to date, and the other measures are those that the president had spoken about and uh, that had entailed in the Public Health Act currently in place. Oh, sorry. And basically, we're looking at uh, failure to follow those directive given, the fines, jail terms. We have re most recently one of our senators losing his position because of not following directives. We have our uh, restaurants uh, being threatened with the revocation of their licenses and the trans those in the transport industry also being threatened with re revocation of their licenses or permits if they don't follow the directives. So basically the public act during this time of the coronavirus pandemic um, has been put into place to try and uh, limit the disease spread. And anyone who doesn't follow the, those directives can actually be um, taken on through the legal channel. So basically coming into sports, I'd already alluded to this, um, the cessation of global sporting activities, especially those three first months, although we had some countries in, in Africa, we had Burundi as one of the countries that did not stop, but major majority of our countries stopped uh, their sporting activities. This affected all sporting disciplines. This was um, affecting both our contact and non-contact sports. And when we look at resumption, I already mentioned this earlier, we saw a resumption most um, majorly around football. Uh, we've seen the Bundesliga, the in English Premier League, La Liga. Uh, I know in tennis, uh, uh, what's his name? The famous uh, Croatian uh, tennis player whose name has uh, conveniently disappeared. So he attempted to have a tournament and unfortunately they got infected. So I know in the tennis world, there hasn't been much in terms of um, resumption of sports. Uh, in Africa, I know that uh, in South Africa, um, and unfortunately this, we have a lot of cases going up. There was a go ahead to continue with activities, but I know there was caution being exercised by the sporting federations because um, we know that anywhere where people come together, there is a risk of resurgence of infections. And when we look at the anti-doping activities, these have continued. I know scaled down, but have not stopped completely. And what we are seeing is um, a trend of people still being uh, banned uh, by the Athletics Integrity Unit. And um, what is currently of note is that we have a trend of whereabout failure. This may be as athletes we may need to look at. Um, yeah. I hope I'm not going too fast. Okay, uh, so as we look at the considerations in the, uh, in the world of sports, so how are we able to prevent disease transmission? Because this, in, in essence, will be promoting safety in sports. So we're looking at issues of disease surveillance, detection of those who are ill, and managing the cases um, that come up. So disease surveillance means basically as we walk into buildings, we see um, the security guards having the th thermal guns or th thermometer guns, checking temperatures. Some places even go as far as asking questions about people who have um, had, uh, who are presenting with symptoms. And this is cough, uh, a fever, uh, a running nose. They would ask you even if you've had contact with somebody who's suspected to have COVID or has been treated of COVID. So basically surveilling the community. And in this case, it would mean our athletes to see who is presenting with the symptoms so that if anyone is a suspect, we can uh, put them under investigation, detect the case and manage it uh, thereafter. And uh, one of the ways we can do that or case detection or basically just make the sport safe is testing. So testing for the disease. So that is something that uh, the federations and in this case in rugby, you have to look into 
what are the testing protocols and how will you apply them for, for your sport. Then we have uh, the medical teams. How will you engage them to spearhead these medical activities? Um, how will you network with the national and country response teams? Because we realize you cannot do this on your own and there are already systems in place. So how, how do the federations latch onto these? And then also, um, how do we strengthen our links with the Ministry of Sports? Because the Ministry of Sports is a larger body that can engage the Ministry of Health to assist uh, the uh, sporting community in Kenya. And then uh, within the counties, we have the Department of Sports that we, uh, we probably should be linking up with to give support to the teams. Um, then the federation protocols in place. So we realize that most of the federations have their own return to sport uh, or safe sport guidelines. So these are in place. So these can also be put into consideration. And then we are also looking at the infrastructure that has been placed. Uh, so this is within the level of training at the level of competition. So we need to look at that. And some of this is um, um, ensuring that you have a regular supply of clean water. We have sanitization points or boots having, um, what do you call it? I don't know if that would be something that is affordable to our federations, but uh, investing in having teams uh, residing within uh, fixed uh, abodes. So you have players not going out into the community and that is also would help in reducing the transmission. So that is some of the infrastructure that would likely uh, need to be put in place. And as we look at uh, return to competitive sport, we're looking at issues of travel. So travel between counties, um, so maybe from Nairobi to Kajiado, Nairobi to Mombasa, we're looking at uh, travel within the counties, forgive that, uh, forgive that spelling error. We're looking at travel within the counties. We know that certain areas within counties have a higher disease prevalence, what we're calling hotspots than others. So that is something that also has to be put into consideration. So one of the things that uh, happened in the beginning, and this is actually a plus for sports, as the disease came in, our athletes were part of the picture. And this is one of the rugby players um, encouraging the members of the public and other athletes to practice the precautionary, uh, the precautionary measures that had been put in place. So this is a role that athletes had played in the beginning and will continue to play. And as we continue looking into sport, we are role models. So this is a role we will continue to play actively. And one of the areas that we have been looking at uh, is the area of stigmatization, especially around those who have tested positive. So that is another area where we believe that uh, athletes can come in strongly to help the community fight against uh, stigmatization. So I put up a series of pictures to just look at some of the things that we do specifically in uh, rugby. So this is a uh, uh, credit to, all, to the photographer and uh, the models in the picture. So we're looking at uh, a training session. So we have our athletes together in the gym, we have the equipment. So basically we're looking at, so what are, what are some of the activities we carry out in our various sports? And when we look at these activities, this is also guide us uh, as we look at the directives that have been put out for the larger community. Uh, are we able to follow these directives uh, within our um, communities as athletes to ensure that we are uh, conducting safe sport? So here we have our athletes using this, the resistant bands. Um, you can see that they are at least attempting to have some social distance. Sorry. Yeah, we have the athletes still within the gym. Yes, we have the athletes together. Um, we have our athletes huddling after their session. And as we look at the competition phase, 
we look at some of the things that make us, well, you know, make, uh, I won't say myself, but the athletes want to play rugby, um, the adrenaline rush, uh, the images of um, the spectators in the stadium. So it's a, it's a very exciting thing to be out on the field. And basically, as we look at it, uh, I've alluded to it here, as we look at resumption of activities, we need to see how to return to training, especially where we have athletes who have not been able to latch onto the virtual platforms or any sort of platform to keep their, um, their fitness levels up, and then also look at how to return to competition. But generally what we're seeing is that the Ministry of Sports, the Ministry of Health, are the ones that will give guidance to the athletes as to what, or basically through their federations, as to how they will return to sport and when they will return to sport. So as has already been mentioned by Tom, there's a guideline or protocol that is in place through the Ministry of Sports. We wait to see what uh, advice they will give. And as I mentioned, this still has to go to the larger national response uh, committee that will advise if that is in order to allow then the, the Ministry of Sports to give the go ahead to the federations to start. Uh, but basically what we are looking at, um, have we reached the point where the curve is flattened? Basically meaning, has the number of cases gone down to the extent that we feel it is safe to allow people to come together, in this case as athletes, to participate in sports. So what we are seeing realistically in Kenya, we are still having an exponential increase in cases. We still have not reached that point of a flattened curve. So as we're looking at um, the return to training, and then return to competition once we feel that we've trained adequately. How do we want to do this resumption? Do we want to go all out? Do we want to do it as a phased approach? Do we want to do it as uh, pilot programs or do we want to have it in all the counties? So I, I, I believe that uh, rugby is practiced in uh, not only in Nairobi, but by default Nairobi is the center of most of our sporting activities. So how do we want to approach it? Do we want to have a pilot program where, where the home of most of our activities are and then using this uh, platform, go out and roll out these programs in the counties or do we just want to go out and do it, uh, launch several uh, programs of restarting within each of the counties? Excuse me briefly. So uh, other things we'll probably have to consider as federations. What infrastructure do you have at your training grounds? And I already alluded to this. So we're looking at uh, hand washing points, ensuring we have regular water. We have posters. Um, uh, advertising what needs to be done, uh, washing our hands, wearing our masks, uh, what infrastructure would we have to put into the, um, other than the training grounds, where our, our athletes shower as they finish. Um, as we look at the competition venues, what other infrastructure may we have to invest in? Huh? So basically this I've already, I've already mentioned. Um, the other issue probably we may need to look at as federations is uh, transportation, accommodation for our members. So basically what we are seeing is that, um, for example, if we test our athletes and find them to be negative for the virus, are we are going to allow them back into the community and risk them getting infection and then coming back into training and risk infecting other people, especially as we look at persons coming from areas that have been listed as hotspots and then also the transportation our players use as they leave the training grounds. Are we, will we be allowing them to use public transport? Will we hire transportation for them? So those are areas that uh, will probably need to be, to be looked into. Um, sorry, I also forget hiring of medical personnel. Would you, um, as are our clubs or our federations, um, do we have the funds to have medical personnel who are particularly or specifically dedicated to our sport so that we don't have medical personnel um, working in other areas and then risking getting infection and as they come to serve the athletes, 
um, likely to infect them. So these are some of the activities that will probably need to be factored in into the budget. Uh, daily surveillance for symptoms, who will do it, how frequent will they do it, um, how will it ensure that each member of the team does that. When we look at testing, who will uh, bear the cost of testing, how frequently will you do it. Um, Currently, uh, testing is being recommended at either the 7th or at, oh, sorry, my internet seems to be acting up. So we're looking at uh, testing costing up to 10,000 or 15,000 shillings per individual. Uh, and that is looking at the private sector. In the public sector, we have the government um, catering for testing, but they're doing that for the larger community. So if we take that route, we end up having athletes fighting with, uh, or not fighting, but competing with the general public uh, to access testing. And then looking at it, when we have sick persons amongst us, and especially they fall sick within uh, the training grounds or competition grounds, who takes care of the cost? And um, as we look at the hospital and home-based care, how will we take care of the athletes? And uh, this is also looking at uh, issues of quarantine versus isolation. Quarantine refers to keeping persons who have come into contact with uh, a suspected case or someone who has been confirmed until they themselves have been tested. Isolation refers to uh, keeping away those who have tested positive for the virus. Viral shedding refers to those who have been found positive because the virus has been found in their samples. So um, we, we would not uh, encourage these persons who have positive results to be within the community. They have to be in isolation so that um, the others can participate in uh, sports uh, safely. Reinfection refers to those who had the infection getting it again. Uh, this is a phenomenon that we're still studying. Uh, some quarters say there are people who have been reinfected after, infect, after the first infection. There's some who say we have uh, immunity that is conferred up to six, uh, six months. Another thing is disclosure, meaning um, who should know about the positive result. Um, so probably appointing a spokesperson uh, in the club. But here we have the right of the athlete or the person to have uh, to say whether their results should be disclosed to the public or not. The club may go as far as we have one or two persons, but in terms of the names, the, athlete, uh, the athletes' rights will predominate here. The other issue we are looking at, mental health. So we have these issues of stigma that have uh, been traumatizing most of the people. What will people say once they know I'm positive? Will I be isolated? Uh, or ex uh, from my community, from the sports uh, industry? Will I lose my, uh, my, my uh, what do you call it, my parks that I usually get to advertise uh, products? Uh, will, I, will I die? Will my family be ostracized? So we have a lot of issues on mental health that we'll also probably need to get uh, mental health experts to assist in. And during this time, although this isn't directly related to COVID, uh, it's a time that most of the federations can take up uh, to sort of brush up the knowledge of our athletes on anti-doping regulations, violations, other regulations that are, um, that are used in uh, and then uh, we can have, I mean, we have certificate courses that the athletes can take up. And who knows, some of these skills garnered can help our athletes later on in their days when they're not active. Okay, then as I'd mentioned, as we look at return to sports, because a number of our athletes have been inactive, we have to ensure that the training is up to, up to the recommended standard. So the fitness level has to be um, as per the recommended standard, otherwise our athletes risk having uh, 
uh, picking up injuries and that would even knock them out, especially once the, the government says that we can resume sports. So we look at the unique aspects of each sport, where the contact areas, we're looking at our warm up areas, we're looking at issues of shared equipment. We've seen the pictures of the gym where we have the shared dumbbells, uh, we have the shared uh, bands. Uh, what are they sharing? Are they sharing homes and personal items? Are the athletes sharing rooms? Shared, are they sharing surfaces? We have the, uh, the toilet and bathroom facilities. So we need to look into that. What is unique in our sport? And looking at the precautionary measures, how can we enhance safety in these areas of our training? And this is a good time, and I know a lot of people have uh, taken advantage of it using the virtual training platforms. Although we appreciate that for this, there is an internet cost for the athlete. Are they able to meet that? Do they have the space and the equipment to carry out the activities that have been advised? Then we're looking at, are we ready to uh, do personal training? And is the athlete going to be uh, able to pick up the fitness level to the required standards? And if it is team training, how will we do it? Do we start with two persons? Do we start with three? But remember the government directives currently, we are more than 15 people are not allowed. Actually, there is a ban on social gatherings. So maybe the team training is something that uh, may wait for the government to allow us to meet. Uh, then there's the use of appropriate training equipment in the grounds to avoid injury. How will the fitness be assessed to ensure that our players are at, uh, up to par? How will injuries be managed? How are medical personnel engaged? Once, um, I know not everyone has the benefit of having a personal gym. Some do, but others don't. So what are the risks of having um, our athletes go to public gyms at the moment, but how many realistically can access um, a personal gyms? You already mentioned the accommodation and transport for the players as they train. Then as we look at uh, the sports, the other things is what is the level of contact? An individual jogging on the sport using a resistant band, uh, what, is, what is of high risk? Having two people together on the pitch, having one person on the pitch, what is that one person doing? What are these two people doing? And as we look at, uh, sorry. Sorry, I went a bit ahead. Uh, uh, just a minute. Um, I'm still getting. Sorry. So as we look at um, the high risk activities, low risk activities, we're looking at um, do we want to engage our, our players who are at the national team level or do we want to engage all of them, which includes even the amateur levels at primary and secondary school level? Who will provide and what personal protective equipment do we need? Who will conduct the infection prevention control trainings for the athletes? How will we go about restructuring of the grounds? How many people do we engage for training session? How many do we engage in competition? And uh, uh, coming up with the written protocols that will be followed. And then the other thing is uh, basically looking at uh, insurance for covering the medical care of the athlete. So in uh, competition, we're looking at issues of accommodation. Will each person come from their home into the uh, competition venue, or will we have all the players, and, and including the athletes, support personnel, living in one place for about two or three months as they go about their circuits? Issues of transport, issues of travel between counties within the county. International travel will have to wait for the government's directives, and we also even as we travel, need to see what the regulations are in the countries that we will be traveling into. 
Uh, one thing that is predominating now for those who have resumed sport is they don't have spectators. So that is something we probably have to look into. And this will affect, uh, probably affect our sponsors because we use that revenue. We use that uh, visibility for the sponsors. So that is something we have to look at. Look at. Then management of those who present with disease or symptoms at competition. How do we contact? How do we trace their contacts? How do we evacuate sick individuals to facilities? And then the other issues of uh, probably cleaning equipment that are shared, in this case, the rugby balls. And uh, how will we manage injuries? Not necessarily uh, because of COVID. And so as we look at management of cases, Persons of interest will refer to persons who present with symptoms that are uh, basically what meet the criteria for someone who has the COVID infection or the COVID-19. Persons under investigation are persons who are being tested. A confirmed uh, person is one who has been found uh, from a reliable source to have the infection. One who has recovered is after having infection is uh, noted to have as per the test uh, not to have infection anymore. Uh, we talk about quarantine and holding facilities. The government has these. So we're looking at the possibility of um, federations uh, investing in these. Isolation facilities, as I mentioned, isolation is where we'll keep persons who are tested positive. What are the treatment facilities available? Because I know the federations don't have uh, any currently, but we, we can take or uh, make use of the ones in the government. The only challenge now is that uh, most of the facilities have, uh, are at full capacity. So what happens once we resume sports? Do we have a dedicated facility or how will we go about it? And then as we look at vulnerable persons within our, our federations, as we look at athletes, do we have athletes who have underlying medical conditions? We have officials who are of ages where we know that the immunities is uh, lowered or affected. Or do we have officials who have underlying, uh, commu um, underlying uh, medical conditions? And as we look at the athlete support personnel who we engage, is there anyone who is listed as a vulnerable person? And as we manage cases, we've mentioned the physical well being, they're symptomatic and mild, necess uh, don't necessarily have to be in hospital once confirmed. The government has the current guidelines, but we have those who are uh, gravely ill or severely ill who have to be in hospital. But this one, I will not uh, stop emphasizing the mental well-being. This also has to be taken care of. So I'd mentioned, uh, we keep talking about masks. Here, I just wanted to show an individual wearing a mask. So we have currently our cloth masks, and then we have the medical mask. So our cloth mask is a non-medical mask. Then we have our medical mask, where it's a surgical mask, uh, the surgical mask, and the N95 or its equivalent, such as the KN95. So the mask generally, a lot of people are still uh, struggling with that, has to cover the nose and the mouth. Uh, and what we are seeing a lot of people lower the, the mask all the way to their chin and then return it. Or some uh, stay with it all the way uh, throughout the, the day in this way and engage their colleagues. Remember when you're masked, you protect, you protect the other person from getting infection. When you're both masked, you prevent each other from infection. And uh, as we look at the, the safety of masks, the cloth masks are used because they are widely available and much cheaper than the surgical and the uh, KN95 and 95 masks. And the medical masks are known to have uh, better filtering uh, capacity. They are safer, but for the general public, the cloth masks are also, um, they are basically acceptable. So I'll just end my presentation by saying we are facing unprecedented times and we, are fall we have a definite risk where we don't follow precautionary measures, but this is not just in sports, but also in the community. Uh, the public good overrides our personal needs and preferences. So you'll find that the government will come hard on us to follow directives and if they feel that an activity will risk the public good, the government will clamp on that as we've seen it. And uh, what we have is uh, international, international uh, federations have already come up with some return to sport guidelines, but these have to wait for the go ahead from our governments. So I'll uh, finish my presentation there. And uh, yeah, probably uh, invite questions or if there is any other issue.
Thank you. Uh, 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 Sasa Doc, uh, Asante okay. Sana, you you, yeah. you you are you are very very comprehensive. Uh, yes. You, you you may have been speaking a bit fast, but uh, there there are not too many questions arising from your presentation, yes. which which is a is a good thing. So uh, I, I I I I I don't know how, how you want to do this. Do you, do you just want to uh, peep at the chat, or do I read the questions out for you, and and you see how to, how to tackle them? I think uh, you can read out some questions, and then I can tackle whichever I oh, oh, I will be okay. able to. Oh, oh, okay. The 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 the, the first question. Uh, yes. he seems to have given up. He says, "Is there any research in Kenya on getting a vaccine, or are, are we waiting for the one developed by by Oxford University and other countries?" I, I I don't know if you have any info you can share on that. Okay, currently I'm not aware of any vaccines being uh, developed in Kenya, as uh, it's it's quite an expensive venture, so you would need a lot of resources for that. So we're currently basically watching what is going on in Oxford in the US to see what they have. So basically from that, we can, uh, we can then now latch onto their research. It's actually quite, uh, it's quite expensive. And as you can see, we are struggling a bit with, uh, with a number of things in the country. Yes. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a second question. Uh, how can we reduce cases, yet our community lifestyle is, is part of, of spreading COVID-19. How, how best can we run our lives with this? Well, um, as, as we've all seen, it's, it's not the easiest of battles. And we've seen that uh, the, the battle is in the, the hands of the medics. But we have our role as the community, and that is why I put up that first slide that shows that we are all part of communities, regardless of where we come from. So the precautionary measures um, that are in place, we hope will be able to stem the spread further. So um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen our marketplaces, our matatu stages. We've seen sometimes even in our places of worship where once they were open, some people who just do not want to follow the regulations. So what what is happening is that um, nobody that comes from your mouth, if you are infected, is likely to connect to, sorry, is likely to infect the, the person who is with you. The other issue, that is uh, proper use of masks should help us to sort of stem uh, the spread. There is also um, avoiding social gathering. So one of the things we've seen and uh, that is quite distressing is the political uh, field. We're seeing a lot of people calling for political rallies and people coming together. We're seeing funerals of uh, musicians and uh, famous people, people coming together. But we ourselves, what responsibility can we play? As we ask that question, are we throwing parties for our friends? Are we throwing parties to celebrate the ease of restrictions? So we also have to really take uh, seriously that directive that we should avoid social gather gathering. The other thing is persons who test positive and still choose to mingle within the society. This might be a, a bit difficult, not a bit, but it's quite difficult as you've seen. We are, uh, we are lagging behind in tracing contacts and contacts means persons who were associated or, or in association or exposed to positive um, persons and they don't know their status, so they may have become positive and are, are walking around in the community. So basically, if you've had uh, contact with somebody who has suspicious symptoms, anyone who has been treated for COVID, in as much as there's that, is that fear of uh, maybe stigmatization, people being afraid to be taken into quarantine facilities, uh, we should just you know, look at the greater good if I suspect that I may be positive, I should not go out into the community. And this goes out to persons who present with flu, so that is coughing, a running nose, a blocked nose, but still choose to go out in public and was still remove their masks and risk infecting other people. So if we follow the precautions, 
we should be able to stem it. It's just unfortunate that it's an infectious disease, so it will move from one person to the other. And this rise that we're seeing in cases is something that was expected. But I think uh, there, there was a lapse somewhere uh, amongst ourselves, as we can still hear people saying COVID is not real. It's um, a ploy to get money. Uh, have you ever seen anyone with COVID? There are those questions still lingering. People are saying young people with strong immunity do not die from COVID. Unfortunately, that is not the truth. We are having younger people without underlying conditions getting COVID. So let's put out the message, COVID is real, it's with us. We don't see it. You may be asymptomatic. So please, if you've been in contact with somebody who's positive, get tested, know your status. We have the government line 719. Each county has a response team that gives a number in case you suspect that you may have a problem. You can reach out to so that you're assisted. Don't go out into the community and cause more infection. If you see people coming together for political rallies, uh, let's be the voice of the communities. That is a risk of infection. So we have a, a, a role to play personally, but also in our communities. But following the guidelines, we hope we'll be able to stem this um, crazy rise that we've seen in the last uh, one month. Uh, uh, the, 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 there's a question from Motor Williams, which, which, which dwells on mental health. I, I don't know if you'll be able to tackle that. He's, he's just, he's asked two questions, I, I think picked from your bullet. Uh, yes. how, how prepared are we to tackle issues related to mental health now and uh -huh. post-COVID? Mm -hmm. And uh, what can athletes do in order to improve their mental wellness? Okay, in terms of how well prepared we are, currently, um, I think as of uh, March, the government has put in place um, hotlines where we can call in as a public. So the number that we have currently is 1199. That's 1199. Uh, that is linked to the Red Cross. And they are, that, that line is open 24 hours. You can call that line anytime uh, if uh, there is any issue. So that is somebody maybe who is feeling uh, burdened. Uh, maybe you've come into contact with somebody who's positive, you're afraid. Somebody who's tested positive, you're in home-based isolation, you're afraid. Um, people facing economic crisis because we appreciate that a lot of us have had uh, our economic activity shut down. So a man or a woman who is a breadwinner is being asked, um, how come we're not having meals like we used to have? So if, if a person feels overwhelmed, we can reach out to those numbers. So how well prepared those, um, that hotline is available. Uh, the, only uh, the only major challenge is that these are call-based assistance as opposed to face-to-face -face assistance because of the the current challenges being faced that uh, we are avoiding people coming into contact, especially the medical personnel, unless it is in a hospital setup. So we want to protect the healthcare personnel. In terms of uh, managing uh, the athletes who have mental health issues, um, I, uh, basically what we can, or the approach that can be used is if we have medical teams within our federations and these medical teams uh, probably link up with uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, bring them on board or have links with them so that anyone within a federation is able to reach out to the federation officials and then is linked up to uh, the mental health services. I think that would be the best way to approach it, but if any person may have need, then they can approach the, the hotline to get assistance. I'll skip one question. The next question is mm. uh, if, if what is being said is true, that the mortality rate after infection is increased due to underlying health issues, would you also recommend testing for these to, to, together with testing for COVID-19 should return to competition be allowed? Sorry, what's the last part? Oh, okay, what, 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 what Charles is saying is uh -huh. uh, since the mortality rate is 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 uh is considered high if you've got other underlying health issues so uh -huh. so should, should we do complete health checks to to uh to check for any underlying issues uh, as as well as if if somebody is doing a covid-19 test would you recommend that 
Okay, that's a very interesting question. Yes, it's true that uh, are there are persons with underlying issues. So um, within us, we have people who already are known to have. So for these people, uh, I would I would advocate reach out to your reach out to your healthcare providers so that you can get advice on what to do, especially if you have any underlying health conditions. Uh, reach out to your employers so that you can be given the assistance you need. If you need to work from home, work from home rather than coming into office spaces. Uh, in terms of checking for underlying issues, well, um, hmm, that uh, uh, coming up, which I would suggest maybe we can use it uh, using that approach is new onset diabetes. So if you've uh, been listening to the, um, the briefs, we have diabetics being among those who are most uh, greatly affected. So these are diabetics who are known to have diabetes, but we are also seeing people who have never been diabetic coming in with blood sugars that are extremely high. So one of the things we're trying to look at as, as medics, if, um, if someone just comes in with no history of uh, diabetes, and we notice that the sugars are high, we are inadvertently, or rather we are finding ourselves doing the COVID test. A number of them have turned positive. So in the line of diabetes is where maybe we have noticed a trend where we are sort of following up and using the, the numbers of, of patients to see if we can come up with protocols. But for the other underlying issues, um, most, most uh, people who are sick or chronically ill uh, are generally not able to participate in sports for majority of them. So these are people who will likely not engage in sports at a competitive level, but uh, it's basically looking at the, the diagnostic uh, trends. So in diabetes, we look at somebody who is excessively thirsty, uh, passing urine frequently, um, somebody who finds themselves eating excessively but not gaining weight, or those who have um, those who have um, they're obese or they're overweight, um, and they have a family history of diabetes. We have those who present with leg swelling, but these are people or difficulty in breathing. But these are people who are generally ill. They don't participate in sports because their ill health prevents them from doing that. But if you have a mental health, sorry, a healthcare provider, they they able to engage you in that but we do appreciate that we have athletes who are known to have underlying conditions so this is a group i would advocate for talk to uh, your healthcare provider so that you can be given advice so that is those who have diabetes and are using insulin um yeah maybe people who are asthmatic so that we can give you advice as per your case as opposed to giving a blanket statement uh, okay, there, there, there are three questions. Yeah. Uh, question one, uh, 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 how long does one get a result of the test? They, they, they are all, all to do with the, with the, the test on, on COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. How frequently should one test? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, how many days or weeks should pass before the next test? Uh, and, and then three, with the, the cost of testing, quite high, uh, uh, ranging eight, I think, to 15,000. And the uh -huh. scores are big, uh, let, let's say 40 players per team. Uh -huh. uh, are, are there any solutions for affordable tests for sports people? Uh, so uh -huh. like, like similar to what, what they're doing for restaurants, where, 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 where they're charging, uh, I, I think, thousand. One thousand. yes, for the tests. Uh, so let me start with the last one. So I think maybe this is part of what we can try and negotiate through the larger body, that's the Ministry of Sports, to engage the Ministry of Health on our behalf. As a federation, we may not be able to have enough muscle to push for that. So maybe we can lobby, as all the federations, to have the Ministry of Sport lobby so that athletes can be given that leeway. Because yes, that, that cost is quite expensive. So if in a team you have 20 persons, that's already that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. So it's very expensive. So maybe we can look at that as the athletes on the federations within the, the 
the, the Kenyan, within Kenya, can we lobby the Ministry of Sports to lobby on, the, on our behalf to the Ministry of Health to reduce that cost? Uh, in terms of turnaround time, will depend on the lab that is engaged. So in our in the kind of um, decisions we have to make, our turnaround time is usually 12 to 24 hours. That is in a medical setting. So um, we're looking at anything between 24 to 72 hours. That will depend on the, the number of samples that are being delivered to a lab for testing. That will uh, depend on the availability of the testing kits. So we've had a number of times we've run out of testing kits. So we have to wait for the testing kits. So turnaround time will be influenced by that. And as we see, a lot more people are getting tested now. So I don't know if that is, this is something we can also look at as athletes. Can we lobby for a testing facility for athletes specifically? And that would also go in terms of treatment facilities. Is there a way we can lobby? We push and see how far it will reach so that we have a facility that just focuses on athletes rather than being with the general public. Because uh, if we are competing for space with the general public, we may win, we may not win, we may not get that space. So maybe those are some of the things we, we can also look into a testing uh, lab specifically for athletes and maybe even treatment facilities for athletes. In terms of cost of testing, oh, that one is a bit tricky. Yes, in the country currently, um, the, the, the prices are quite high. So we may not have direct, um, direct influence on how it is being charged, but maybe if we use that uh, stage, um, or rather if we use that avenue of the Ministry of Sports, we can engage the ministry to do the testing on our behalf rather than uh, federations having to use their own uh, limited resources because in essence the testing can drain all your resources and then that beats the purpose or beats the, the what we are planning to return to sport if you don't have the money you may not be able to factor in all the other things so maybe we can also use the ministry of sports to sort of help us on that i hope that has answered the question uh, it, it, it is adequate. I, I, I just want to ask uh, a, a follow-up question on 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 on, on, uh, on the tests. Is, is is it only one one test uh, which is reliable? I, I mean, the, the, there's been that debate of uh, of false positives or false negatives. Mm -hmm. uh, so 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 is it just one test you can do? There there the, there's also word of uh, some organisations like like at, at the UN. Who, who do a, a test which the result is in, instantaneous. So is, mm -hmm. is that test uh, also usable, uh, even though you can say it's unreliable? I mean, j j just to give us a, a level of comfort so that we, we understand what, 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 what testing involves. Okay, so maybe I can start with um, the, second, the second question. So when we talk about testing for um, the SARS-CoV-2, we're looking at what we call either antibody-based tests, and the second one is antigen-based tests. So what do you see, um, that swab that is poked down your nose, poked down your throat, um, that will basically, we're doing, we're going to test the antigen. Antigen would refer to trying to find the virus, a particle or a part of the virus that tells us uh, this, uh, how would I put it in a layman's term? Uh, basically, you're looking for the virus. So by uh, um, putting a swab in the nose, putting a swab in the mouth, we are able to, or rather the, 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 the lab teams are able to pick the viral elements. That is an antigen-based test. And the other one is an antibody-based test. The antibody-based test refers to looking, to looking for antibodies that have been generated in the body in response to the virus. So antibodies are basically, uh, they are protein in nature and they basically are part of our immune system and they help us to fight off infections. So uh, they are tests that detect these antibodies. So um, currently the advocated test is the antigen-based test because if you find in this case, we're looking at the secretions. If the secretions from your body 
have viral particles. It means most likely you're infected. The antibodies are not always reliable because um, you may not have them because you've not been exposed to the virus. So sometimes interpretation may be a bit difficult. They are quick to use these antibody-based tests, but they're not reliable. So you find that in our setup, we don't, uh, we don't engage them as much. I know there were some protocols that were being developed in terms of interpreting them, but they are not very reliable. So the most reliable test is actually looking for the virus. So basically it's like uh, a crime scene. A crime scene, you either get the perpetrator in the act, you may get a coat or something the perpetrator left at the scene, and that would be a bit more reliable than using a witness account the way out of the events so once you catch the culprit then you are more confident that yes i caught you in the act so that is why we tend to push more for antigen based tests so we would encourage you go get that swab stuck down your nose and uh, stuck into your nose and uh, into your throat those ones will allow us to pick for the virus in terms of uh, false positives and false negatives, that is something that is encountered. But using scientific methods, we're able to pick the tests that are the best in terms of uh, giving the most accurate results. I know we've seen a lot of it in some results, uh, posting positive, some posting negative. And one of the issues that has been is the type of equipment the lab is using. So if you find a lab that is using um, maybe more advanced equipment, they're able to pick up more elements of the virus as opposed to other labs. So in their case, one lab may pick the virus, the other one may not pick the virus. Uh, you may pick uh, the virus when it is most concentrated in the body. You may also test the same person at a point when the virus is almost finished or let's say at the beginning of the infection, because we're looking at an incubation period of two to 14 days, if you take the test too early, you may also not pick the virus. So at times you may get results that are not uh, accurate, but for medics, and this is what we always encourage, whenever you go for a test, have a medic uh, do the, the clinical scenario for you, because we are able to sort of put the, the things in context. If you want a test, a person may, let's say, for example, walk into a lab and say, I want a test. You may be asking for a test. You've never had any contact with anyone who's, who's infected. You've been stuck in your house for three months. You've never left. As opposed to someone, let's say, a healthcare worker who is constantly in contact with people who are infected or somebody who works in the airport or a police officer who's constantly facing, uh, meeting people who are infected. For such persons, you're able to or if you put it that way, you're able to put the clinicals, you put the scenario into context so that even when the result comes, I'm able to interpret it. But maybe one of the areas that um, may be of interest, if somebody tests positive, for example, how soon would you want to do the test? You may, currently, we, before we used to do it at four, day 14 or after the 14th day, we used two negative tests. But the, the, um, the algorithms for testing to check if the infection has gone down are changing. And uh, these are used as per the current guidelines given by the Ministry of Health. But you will be given the duration of when to test next. We also have the other individuals who may have come into contact with someone who's positive. They test negative at first, but they will also be given advice as to when they will do the next test. So usually these scenarios are are, you are assisted by a medic. Don't do them by yourself because you may, you may lose out a bit on what should be done at what time. So an attachment to a medical personnel, a qualified one, is always useful. Um, I think, uh, have I answered all the, uh, the, the questions? Yeah, 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 yes, those are okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, now, as, as, as a sports person, what is your take on, on masks and training? Can you run with a mask? Oh, that one, that one is a difficult one because um, that one is a difficult one because I know some of the questions had come in is if I'm running and someone is running behind me, for example, and uh, 
some secretions or something comes from my body and happens to land on the person behind me or they get infected. I know there's a lot of talk on that and we will look out on that space to see if there is um, if there's any evidence or yeah, as the evidence comes out, especially for the athletes so that we have uh, protocols that apply to athletes, not just the general public. Uh, training with a mask is something I, I'm not, unfortunately, I was called to the front line, so I have not been training. So I, had, I don't have a personal experience with running with a mask and training with a mask. It must be very difficult. So those are things we really have to look into. And I think that is part of what has uh, influenced the decision to stop sports because it is so difficult. Having someone uh, perform the activities with a mask becomes a bit difficult. The logistics of your mask falling off, do you pick it up, do you wear it again, do you stop play, do you run and get a new one, do you leave it on the pitch if it's soiled, you know, it's a lot of questions. So I think that is part of what influence, just stop the sport, let the situation in the country get calm and then we can engage. Uh, I know for this, those who've managed to test, what they're actually doing once you've tested negative, they're sort of controlled about where you go after that testing so that you're sort of sure that that group of, let's say, 10 people plus, the, um, let's say, the 20 or the five athlete support personnel are not moving from that, from that environment. So that kind of environment you find once they feel, this is a feeling, <laughs> once uh, based on the tests, uh, you feel that the risk is reduced people are having smaller sessions, but this we've seen mostly in Europe and the USA, they're having more of controlled uh, training. So you have maybe three people, but they are very spaced out, people having their own equipment or they are advising on what to do if something is shared. So if you're having the batons in the relays, if you're having balls, maybe don't touch them, kick them. So where the testing is more, uh, is done more frequently where uh, there's a lot of investment in that. They are able to do it for us. It will. It, it, it's kindly currently risky. So um, that is that is why basically we say just wait until the situation is calm, then you get back because we know it's very difficult for athletes to to practice their sport with the masks. Oh, 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 okay. Th th thanks so much, Doc. There, there, there's still a few more questions. Uh, but I want to release you. We've been okay. we've been almost one and a half hours, and and, and I know you're extremely busy. Uh, so if you get a chance, you, you can just glance at at, at the chat. Oh, okay, whatever is there, they're not really tough questions. So one one is talking about moving about Nairobi and and the risk involved, which you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. that that we can't keep everybody in a camp. And then the other aspect we forgot, we focused so much on the athletes, we forgot, we forgot, we forgot about the support staff because uh, we, 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 we do have coaches, we've got grounds people uh, yeah. who, 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 who may not be as healthy as we'd expect and, and would fall in, into, the, in, into the, those vulnerable groups. So, so we, we all, all have to keep that in mind as, as we go along. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just ask, the chairman, uh, Odur Gangla, I think is still on. If, if he wants to give just a short vote of thanks, and, and then we can release you. Uh, I think we've lost him. I think we've lost him. <laughs> okay, he seems to have left. left. So, so, so for, for, for the clubs who are here, uh, Oh, 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 I, I, I just ask. Let, let's go to the World Rugby website. Let, let's go to Passport. There, are, there there's resources there on uh, on the whole situation on, on COVID. There, 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 there's some brief guidelines on return to play. There was a question uh, which asked, okay, so when, when do we get back onto the field? And, and I think the doc was very clear. Let, let, let's wait for the directives from the government. Uh, they, they, they will tell us when they, they feel it is safe to go back to play and, uh, and, and under what conditions we'll be able to go back. The, the, the guidelines from World Rugby are broad and uh, point number one is always uh, to, to listen to your local Ministry of Health. So it depends on what the Ministry of Health says and then we'll pick up from there and, and, and we'll localize those guidelines for everybody. So my, mine is just to say thanks to everybody for turning up.
and uh, let's have a good evening. And, and Doc, that is, thanks so much. Thank you. So nice evening to everyone. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you. Oh, uh, ch ch the chairman's coming back. <laughs> oh, okay. So, Chairman, we, 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 we were just closing and we just wanted you to say a quick thanks to Doc and then we can leave. Hi. Hi, Sorry. Chairman. Yes, just, just, just a quick word for Doc, and then, then we can... Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Th thanks, thanks, Thomas. Uh, I just want to say a very big thank you, Dr. Koth, for spending your evening with us on this uh, webinar. Uh, we had a very good representation of uh, club officials, coaches, uh, match officials, I've also seen sighting officers. So there is a great interest in when rugby will uh, return and when it does, what are the protocols that need to be observed. There's obviously a lot for us to take home and go share with our colleagues at the club. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, you will still find time again to come and uh, talk about uh, this same topic with us because uh, this topic is evolving quite fast and uh, we still need to do a lot of uh, uh, training and education around this so that if games do restart, we're able to put in place the right protocols. The biggest challenge certainly is just the, the cost of, of managing the, the, the pandemic. When you, you just read through the list of the requirements for training and what have you, it will be very challenging for the union and also for the clubs to be able to afford that. So our challenge to you is to then see, given the socioeconomic environment in Kenya, what is acceptable? What can we do without necessarily putting uh, players and uh, coaches and key stakeholders at risk if rugby does return? So that's uh, one of the things that we are you're really, really wrestling with. So we'll throw the ball to you to reflect about it and see what is a, a Kenyan solution. Because otherwise, if you were to do all those things, the reality is very few people would be able to, to return, especially in the, in the mass market sports. Uh, I think with uh, those comments, I'll uh, just want to thank everyone for attending the, the webinar today. Uh, I also noted that uh, we had a, a representative from Rugby Africa, John Bosco Mwamba, who's been uh, a regular, Sante Sana uh, Bosco, uh, and keep up uh, supporting KRU. So I think let's close there and uh, let's continue to observe the COVID-19 uh, regulations in terms of staying safe. And uh, I know we have our AGM next week. We are looking forward to interacting with the affiliates on, on that occasion. Thank you. I, maybe Tio, you can give further guidance. I don't know. Are we having another one next week? Uh, we, 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 we'll try and see if we, if, we, if we can have something next week. It, it, okay. It's good to keep people engaged. And, uh, uh, and as, as, as Doc said, this, this is a good time also. So let's get our online certification and, and, and just improve our knowledge on the game. Yes, no, absolutely, we should. We should do that. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. So, so, so people, th 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 thanks so much. Have a good evening and bye. Okay, well, bye. Good evening. Thanks, Doc. Thank you. Bye. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs>